am uh, John Moorhead. I am the host of the Multi-Faith Matters podcast, and my guest today is Phil Wyman, and this is another joint podcast. He'll be releasing this on the Wild Theology podcast, and uh, Phil is uh, no stranger to uh, folks, obviously, on Wild Theology or Multi-Faith Matters, if you've seen many of the episodes, but for those who somehow have been living under a rock and don't know who Phil is. Phil is not only a good friend and colleague, but uh, he's a former pastor at The Gathering in Salem. He's had a ministry out there in which city for many years. He's gearing up to do some travel in, uh, and spend some time in Wales, and we'll give Phil a, a chance to share a little bit about that after we have our conversation, and maybe even invite folks to get involved in supporting this exciting venture. So Phil, welcome back to the podcast. You know, I, I was thinking it's probably the people who are living under the rocks who know where we are. Who we it are. could be. That could be. <laughs> that could be. So yeah. does that mean they're stoned? See what I did there? Yeah, you know, uh, that's probably true, too. <laughs> yeah, that, that could be. Being stoned might help appreciate what we're doing a little bit more. But <laughs> today, Phil and I are going to talk about a topic that uh, came on my radar in an increasing way recently. We're going to talk about uh, liminality. And all God's people said, what in the world is liminality? Uh, a little background yeah. before Phil and I have this conversation. Uh, recently, I did a podcast on, I thought it would, I wanted to do something on Halloween, and I thought it would be kind of cool, rather than just do the usual historical, cultural kind of conversation that's important. Uh, one of the things we Christians do is we often uh, scapegoat uh, and make some false claims about Satanists and pagans when it comes to Halloween. So I had a Satanist and pagan come on the program and said, what do you think about Christian perspectives on Halloween? And we were having this conversation, and um, I, I think it was they asked me, you know, why do you enjoy the holiday so much? And as I was kind of reflecting in the moment in the conversation, I said, I really enjoy being in the liminal space. And perhaps even more so, and we'll get to this question as we have the conversation, I think I might even enjoy the liminal space more than the home turf, if you will. And the more I thought about that after the podcast, I thought, man, there's a conversation and a topic in that on its own, you know, just talking right. about liminality. And so I've been thinking about it ever since, but to kind of help the, the listener and the viewer who doesn't know what liminality is, let's define our terms as we get started. Basically, liminality comes from the Latin term limen, and it means right. edge or threshold. And it's a metaphor of a doorstep. You're leaving the home space and you're going out into something else. It's that in-between space. And scholars have been talking about this for a number of years. I looked at it a little bit, although I wanted to move beyond it with my Burning Man thesis. Um, some of the early work, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this name right, Arnold Van Gennep or Gennep or right. something like that. And yeah. Victor Turner picked up on this. And the way they discussed it was this journey of the preliminal you move into the liminal space, and then you re-aggregate back into the tribe. They were looking at uh, tribal kinds of perspectives. Another way of looking or talking about it, conceptualizing it, is, is moving into anti-structure. You're, you're in a structured kind of safe place, uh, and when right. you cross the threshold, you get into anti-structure, and then it transforms you, and then you go back into where you were before, having gained something, some kind of transformation right. through the process and scholars have been talking about that for some time so yeah you and i are going to talk about the liminal space and i think this has application to uh not only the spaces you and i are in multi-faith festivals right but how we conceive of church and mission and all kinds of things um so yeah, yeah, yeah. as i talk about liminality do you want to add anything to definitions or, or conceptions or anything like that yeah so it with its um, with it being sourced in anthropology, you know, the, mm -hmm. its definition being developed in anthropology, um, it it um, it it's rather interesting for me to look at it from that perspective. With with I suppose both a um, looking at it as it has lessons for me as well as I have some critiques of the way mm -hmm. it's been perceived mm -hmm. um, or the way it's been presented to us. Um, you know, for, for Gennep, it was 
the liminal was that space of transition. Um, you know, the, the place where we, we utilize the root word is in our word preliminary. Mm -hmm. You know, that's so, so he had a categorization, Genep did, of the preliminary, the liminal, and then the post liminal. Mm -hmm. And so the liminal was the space where you've left something and you're not quite defined yet. Right. And, or, or at least you're not quite initiated if it's religious. Um, of course, he, you know, he expanded it beyond the religious to social changes um, in society um, and cultures. It wasn't just a religious transition. And then post-liminally, um, now you have an initiation or a transformation into a new thing, right? Um, and then when, when Turner comes along, he seems to um, give it, or at least this is one of the critiques, he gives the liminal space a positive um, category that it, the transition is towards something better. That's kind of the way he's looking at it because he's, you know, he's looking at religious transformation and people looking for something better. Um, and that was critiqued. Um, Agnes Horvath has done some interesting stuff along that. And she critiqued Turner saying that he was looking at it in, in just a positive sense. And, and so I, I did tend to, like when I was writing Burning Religion, not utilize, I didn't utilize the term um, because I found it tended to carry that dynamic of positive transformation. Whereas I was looking at the liminal space as both potentially positive, but potentially negative. And it was kind of a dangerous space, mm -hmm. right? And when, and when I say dangerous, I mean, even in a positive sense, because, you know, kind of like, mm -hmm. And like C.S. Lewis talking about um, uh, uh, what's the lion's name in the Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe now. I'm oh, Aslan. To... Yeah, Aslan as an expression of Christ. You know, um, uh, is he safe? Right, <laughs> right, question, right, right. And, he's not and a tame lion. Right. Says, he's not safe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there's both danger, but he is good, right? And so um, I look at that liminal space as something that. It's an adventurous and dangerous space, um, perhaps unlike Victor Turner's view of it, oh, we're moving to a good thing, right? Right. Um, or at least that was one of the critiques about him, whether that's fully true, uh, you know, I can't say. Um, having read his stuff, I'm not sure I've landed with that same critique, although that's what we've taken away from Turner, I think. Right, right. So, yeah, I, I, I look at this liminal space as a space of great adventure, especially for those of us who are missional in our thinking, you know, that we come as Christians and followers of Jesus as, um, as it were, um, adventurers into these spaces that are misunderstood by the church. So... Yeah, I think it's a uh, important point to consider, and I suppose it depends upon what you take away from it, what the transformation ends up being, right? Uh, there right. is a level of danger when you call it anti-structure, right? It, it's upending things that you're used to. It's uh, changing things, maybe even inverting. Um, so, for example, when I did my Burning Man thesis, Burning Man is a, a, a festival that folks may be from, hopefully are familiar with, uh, out in Nevada, and Phil's been there for many years. I did my, my thesis on it, uh, made a trip out there. And a lot of the scholars early on, when I wrote this years ago, that was kind of the paradigm they were looking at, that this involves liminality. People go out there, they leave the mundane, they experience this transformation, and then they go back to their daily lives. Right. Um, now, what's interesting is for some people that can be a positive transformation. For some people, it can be a threatening kind of transformation, right? <laughs> um, and so can the kind of yeah. context that you and I uh, work and do ministry in, in multi-faith engagement. Many times Christians are afraid right. to go there because they don't want to get compromised. They don't want to get tempted by another worldview. Um, they don't want to have their worldview compromised. So there is a danger and a challenge to entering into the liminal space. 
And I think we need to acknowledge that. But at the same time, aren't you and I saying that sometimes in the right way that there's value to going into the liminal if we open ourselves up to the possibility of positive transformation that can come through the challenge? Yeah, absolutely. I don't, you know, I don't want to, on one hand, negate the danger of liminal space, but I don't think um, in some sense, as Christians, we don't have an option but to enter some kind of liminal space. Um, you know, so, so for me, when I was, I was processing this, when I was writing Burning Religion, you know, I was talking about this in-between space that I, I described as having, um, um, it, was, it was an unnavigable space that um we actually could not cross and this is where we find all the you know struggles between right and left in politics between religions that hate each other between uh politics and religion you know th those different things that all battle against each other and i purposely use the terminology unnavigable space because not because i i think that um, it cannot be gapped, but because I think, um, you know, uh, much like, you know, somebody in scriptures, um, what, is, um, what is the impossible is possible with God, right? So if I say that space is possible humanly to traverse, in some sense, I've said, that salvation is a natural rather than a supernatural thing, right? And I think that's what we're left with in a, in, in a missional context in crossing over without becoming, necessarily becoming the other, much the way that Christ crosses over with God to bring us into um, relationship with God. Yes, he becomes human, but does he become sinner? No, but he crosses over to the sinner, right? And it takes this miraculous transformation. If I say that that gap is possible for us to, to traverse across, I've made it for me, I, I feel like I'm making, um, making salvation itself a humanly possible thing. So I'm always looking for this, you know, I, I'm treading this line of we need to do it, but it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> because we need that um you know a salvific work of god to be the person who can stand there and and in one sense become the other without fully becoming the other we understand the other we don't necessarily behave as the other we don't necessarily fully embrace it so so we're stuck between the preliminary and the post-liminal, right? Right. We are, we are in this middle space because that's, in a sense, I believe we're God lives. Um, well, I, I think, uh, what do you think about this idea? I think uh, ideally, you know, in the past, scholars have talked about the liminal in terms of literally physically being in spaces with the other. Right. I think in the age of uh, the internet, um, we need to also be thinking relationally and not just geographically, spatially. Right, so, right. for example, a, a podcast conversation with a Satanist or, or a Wiccan or what have you, or some, you know, digital exchange in an ongoing way can be a form of a, a liminal relationship. What, what do you yeah, think about Yeah, Yeah, yeah a absolutely. Um, you know, yeah. And, I, and, and of course, you know, with, with the COVID season we were <laughs> we were forced into that kind of thing right and um and some of us leaned into it because we're doing this work now what else do we have right right, right. <laughs> so um absolutely and and i uh and i know there's some scholars that are working along those lines of you know this liminal space and um the internet so um you know there there's in a sense where we are anyway and, and because our world has been made smaller, or, or maybe, maybe our worlds have been made larger by the internet, now we can, you know, traverse this globe, um, like we're doing right now, you know, 
you're sitting near Salt Lake and I'm sitting near Palm Springs and, you know, and here we are discussing, yeah, our, uh, our ability to do that um, is pretty important and it's transforming us. It's bringing us into that space between what we were and what we become. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and to give folks uh, examples of the kinds of liminal spaces that we work in, you, uh, again, you've been in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, you've right. been, you go to the UK frequently. You're uh, reaching out to pagans, to festival goers. Uh, my liminal spaces have been with pagans in the past. Uh, more recently, I've, I've had some conversations with uh, members of the Satanic Temple. Right. Uh, Latter-day Saints and so on. Um, so yeah, yeah. in those contexts, uh, what kind of reactions have you had over the years to the liminal space? <laughs> Has it always been positive or have you had some more fearful moments or what's that been like for you? <laughs> of course it hasn't always been positive. <laughs> you know, so, so a lot of this was, um, <clears throat> it was started when I first became a Christian, which was 19, um, 1980 and I was uh, 21. And um, really quickly, I mean, very with within less than a year of being a Christian, I was I was involved with at that time some of the same groups you were involved with. It was like you know Saints Alive and Ex Mormons for Jesus, right? Um, and and for me, it was like now I'm engaging these things that are mo I'm most passionate about. I was raised in another religion, and now you know I'm gonna enter into engaging people with another religion. So it and it's funny to you know. We're, we're both talking about dealing with Latter-day Saints, de <laughs> dealing with neo-pagans. I mean, we're going right and left, <laughs> right? right, right. Bo both politically, or at least typically that way. And so um, I spent a lot of time in Manti, Utah. Um, and, you know, and that was with the spectrum of um, the Mormon church from the you know, the Tongan community that would come down to the Manti pageant, to the polygamists who were living openly with their church in Manti, um, getting to know them. And, you know, in, in one of the first times I went there, I had the combination of, um, you, we'd really like you to move here <laughs> to um, uh, somebody um telling some story about me and the the people who were running the uh festival at manti saying if you do any more of that we're gonna arrest you <laughs> I <was> like what <laughs> I <didn't... laughs> you know so, so and then so i saw that but then you know obviously um when beginning to engage neo-paganism in my transition from, you know, pastoring a church in Carlsbad, California, and then going to Salem in 1999, I, I, I started by um, studying neo-paganism, kind of from, you know, anthropological missiology and writing a paper about it and getting to know the people. And, um, of course, there were a lot of Christians saying, you know, how can how can you be a Christian if you're befriending that group of people? Um, it all hit the fan when I moved to Salem. And, you know, about six years later, I'm being accused of being um, aberrant in my theology and my own denomination simultaneously does two things. On one hand, they give me the largest grant for um, mission work, um, evangelistic and mission work that they'd given up until that point in time. And simultaneously, I get accused of being aberrant, and our church gets tossed out of the denomination. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> both things are happening. The, the right and the left hand in the church, you know, uh, in a sense, don't know what they're, uh, don't know what they're doing there right? They're not communicating with one another, and it becomes too hot to handle, you know, and that, that's where the, the Wall Street Journal story uh, comes up, you know, <laughs> on Halloween day, which is still, befriending which is still a problem in Salem, Massachusetts. So, yeah, I, I, I've seen both the, the side where people, 
they get it and they say, wow, I want to be a part of something like this. And the side where people say this is dangerous and that must mean you're dangerous too. And if you're dangerous, you must not really be a Christian. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've had people from my own denomination literally <laughs> hold up the finger like this, you know, as though to ward me off like I'm a vampire. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was going to ask this question a little bit later, but that your response there is a natural, you know, entry point to it. I, yeah. I often wondered <clears throat> uh, if some in our own tribe, if other Christians look at how much time we spend in the liminal space with people and other religious traditions that are threatening uh, to their worldview wow. and, and their sense of spiritual purity and fears over contamination and all of that valid fears, but you can't let your fears right. overtake you. I wonder if there are times when they look at it. There, there's also one of the things I look at is, is monster theory, which is starting to move from looking at, at horror films into other disciplines. Um, so, for example, philosophers of dehumanization are saying, you know, are we monstrosizing others, whether through race or religion or what have you? Are they looking at the monsters, if you will, of pagans and Satanists and Latter day Saints? And Moving from that concept, of, well, these guys spend a lot of time in yeah. this liminal space with these people. Maybe they're monsters too, and so are they monstrosizing us? Are we viewed as problematic? And maybe even more so because we claim to be Christian, right? These other people right. aren't, but you spend so right. much time with them. Maybe they're maybe they're uh, wolves in the fold, wolves in sheep's clothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 and, and sometimes. Um, Sometimes I, I'll, I'll jokingly refer to myself. I'm I'm not a wolf in sheep's clothing. I'm a sheep in wolf's clothing. <laughs> I've inverted this whole thing, <laughs> you know. So so I can walk into the spaces where the the dangerous other, according to my tribe, born again Christians, um, doesn't view me as a threat. We view them as wolves. Well, I <laughs> to my to my Christian tribe, I better throw on my wolf coat. <laughs> I, I, I think I remember seeing a far side cartoon with that, where there was a sheep with wolf clothing on walking into a group of wolves. And sometimes I, you know, I feel like that, at least as I'm viewed by my own. Right. Um, and yeah, yeah. So, um, that, you know, I, 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 that, that made me laugh so much, I kind of lost your question there. <laughs> <laughs> do, the question really quickly is, do folks, if they uh, monstrosize, if you will, oh, yeah, yeah, people yeah. in other religious traditions, if we spend so much time with them, is there a tendency to maybe look at us as monsters and maybe even more dangerous because we're in the Christian fold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when, when we... Uh, when we moved to Salem, Massachusetts. Um, back in 99, we, we spent a couple years with a small team of people that was going to come with us. And we would meet minimally once a month as it got closer, we were meeting weekly and talking about the process of what it was to move into a place where neo-pagans were the um, were a cultural force. They, they weren't the, you know, they're certainly not the majority of people in Salem, but they are a radically large minority with incredible influence. And the, the largesse of their minority group, it, you know, maybe you look at five to 10% of the people in Salem identifying as witches or neo-pagans in some way, but that is, um, depending on statistics that they look at, it's almost a thousand times larger than your average city in the United States, right? Right. Um, now, I think those numbers are beginning to change, uh, obviously, because it's such a fast growing movement, but it's, it's huge. So we would talk about it. And, and I, I made the statement that we're probably going to run into trouble for trying to befriend the pagan community. And, you know, I didn't realize how close to home it was going to be, but, you know, I said, 
we need to beware the biggest problem isn't going to come from the witches it's going to come from the church you know and i had no idea how close to home that was going to be and and you know yeah this monster monsterizing monstrous mm-hmm. <laughs> monstra yeah whatever the terminology <laughs> is <laughs> um for, uh is that's obviously something that we've done to the other right mm-hmm. if we make if we make somebody if we perceive them as dangerous then obviously we've turned them into a monster and to some degree um when we're trying to befriend those people and build a bridge across to them, then we're standing in a battle zone. And, you know, the rocks and the arrows and the, the gunshots, they're all, they're coming from both sides. And, you know, and in a sense, we're dancing in this battle zone. And so it, it's rather a dangerous pace intellectually and emotionally and um and if we look like a wolf to our own people we're actually closer (laughs) than than that than that tribe they don't like and then as they see us as the problem we're the ones who are getting shot at you know Right. right um friendly fire because you know they see us as dressed in the garb of the enemy um so yeah it's it must be you know like the place of a spy who goes goes into the other side and his own people don't even know that he's a spy right um it's do we look like that to our own people right um and and you know in a very real sense i'm not trying to be a spy i'm just trying to be a friend right but i'm perceived in that perspective the other looks at me as a spy and the my own people don't recognize me <laughs> as being one of them right and the danger is coming from both sides you know yeah well <laughs> Stuck I mean, in the middle with you clowns yeah, to, the left yeah, and exactly. to the right here i am <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've been in the same spot i mean you have too i mean i remember uh, when i was in seminary i wanted to do some different stuff for class assignments and i think it was in my missions course we had to write a paper about engaging a group and i didn't want to do latter day saints everybody does that in utah and i had paganism on my radar as a research topic and i had begun a on- series of online exchanges with a local uh, heathenry group uh, that met close mm. by and i said hey would you mind i have this course assignment i'm supposed to come and do participant observation like an anthropologist would you mind if i came to your next gathering and they said, yeah, and I went there, and um, we developed a relationship, and they invited me to a weekend retreat that they had on a Saturday and asked me to come mm. up and just, just speak as, as a different kind of Christian, which I did, and I came back, and I blogged about it, and this Christian who wrote, uh, all his comment was brief, but it communicated exactly where he was coming from. He wrote, birds of a feather, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and th- there's that, you know, yeah, you're going to a pagan gathering because we know really you're a pagan, right? So it's that whole right, thing right. of you spend so much time with monsters, man, I think you're a monster kind of a thing. So I, I think that dynamic can be problematic in, in multi-faith contexts with liminality. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I found that um, it seems it seems to be coming from two different angles because I, I, I've been accused of, you know, being that dangerous other, of course, more commonly by what we would call the fundamentalist Christian, right? Um, and, and so I, I must be doctrinally uh, a real problem. <laughs> <laughs> and and so i've got to be enough of a heretic that i don't belong in the faith but then there's a, there's like from people who would be liberal in their theology they have a a cultural reference of which they're trying to defend the culture of the church and i must not fit within that either because that dangerous other is culturally dangerous 
they don't look like our tribe and do things like we do. Um, so, uh, yeah, and that I, I, I found that I, I think in my um, in my relationship with some of the people in the UK, that's that tends to what hap happened in the Anglican Church. Some very liberal bishops or pastors of churches are, you know, giving the giving the cross fingers and you know saying stay away from me despite the fact of not holding a conservative theology so so we're stuck in the middle both culturally and theologically uh, and and people are looking at us as dangerous well I, I suppose it's better to be given the cross finger than just the finger i mean we got to look at it positively right <laughs> In a sense, that's what they're doing. That's there. true. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's a sacred, sacralized version of the finger, the secular <laughs> finger. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, they, 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 because they they are um, ostracizing us, or mm. um, you know, saying that you don't deserve to be in this space. It's it's effectively the you know the Christian finger, right? Uh, that's happening in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think it's important to think about liminality in relation to another concept that we'll need to unpack a little bit for folks, and that's the bounded set and the centered set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's been discussed in, in missional circles, missional church, missiology. Um, very mm. quickly, a, a bounded set uh, is one that emphasizes the boundaries, who's in and who's out. Yeah. It has a center, but it puts the emphasis on the boundary. A centered set also has a boundary, but it's more interested in the defining center. So in application to what we're doing, uh, thinking about it in terms of church and mission and, and conversations and relations with the other, I think many Christians and many churches are pursuing a bounded set. They're concerned about it's us and them. They're on the outside. And we want to make sure we got a very strong boundary that we have to constantly reinforce and when we relate to the other, it's more of an effort to pull them on our side of the boundary. It's, it's an evangelistic raiding party, if you will. We'll go out and pull them. And once we absorb them and pull them into our worldview, that's the way it's supposed to be. Then there's the, the centered set that says, yeah, I'm concerned about boundaries too. Everybody has boundaries. However, I really want to emphasize the center, Christ. And the boundaries are, are porous. And it's more about where am I and the other person in relation Right. each other into the center and i think you and i are more comfortable with the the threshold going out and spending time in that liminal space because we're we don't we don't have that that clearly that emphasis on the building the fences would you agree with that kind of connection yeah and uh i i and i i just can't even imagine jesus being a fence builder Right. Um, I suppose I, I see it in that kind of incarnational context. Um, he, uh, Jesus became the other and, you know, lived among us. And um, so, so for me, there's kind of a, without, without that, you know, being stated as such um, in the Bible, it's kind of like, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> <laughs> live live like jesus and yeah so that um the the idea of yeah the bounded set a, a church that has walled itself off um is to me it's, it's establishing itself uh with i i suppose i would look at it if if i was going to be excessively critical it feels like a dead um it feels like a dead religion in, in the sense of um, it doesn't have the flow of life because the walls are built and now it's just its, its own thing. Um, it, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a dam um, establishing a, a lake and you know, yeah, you can keep a lake clean, but it's the flow in and out that that really does that, you know, and, and I can't help but wonder, have we begun to look like the Salton Sea in California? The all water all came in at one place, at, you know, when they put up a dam at um, 
um, the Colorado River on the Arizona um, California border. It flooded the land. And now that's like the most poisonous place you can possibly imagine. They put up a resort very quickly and people were water skiing in it. And it was the new place to go. You know, this is like in, in the, uh, in the fifties. And then pretty soon you have an, and the, the salt levels rising and a poisoning of the water by uh, fertilization and other things occurring. And, and now you go by and it's ghost towns on the edge of the Salton Sea, you know? Um, and the question is, if we put up walls in a sense that we put up dams, that rather than being poisoned by the outsider, do we become internally poisoned um, with our biases and, um, you know, our feelings about those who are outside? Um, yeah, the bounded set, I, you know, within, within creating those kind of boundaries in Christianity, I tend to look at it that way. We potentially are poisoning ourselves like the Salton Sea. Yeah, and I think it's not just churches. It's, you know, individual Christians as well. I, I think the assumption is the bounded set is the way you go about it. You know, how many right. times have we heard, well, invite people to church, right? It's, we don't go meet them where they are. We don't enter yeah. their life spaces. It's, bring them into the home turf. That's where all the really important stuff happens. That's where their transformation is going to happen. Uh, never mind right. the need for our transformation and being open and entering into yeah. others. So yeah, I, I yeah, think yeah, that yeah. that's kind of the perceived modus operandi. Right, right, right. Yeah. And I, I, I never, I never identified with that. Yeah. Um, you know, when I became a Christian, I was doing, I was doing any crazy thing to, to, to take it out. I remember one time this, you know, I'm a brand new Christian. This guy walks up to me and he says, did you ever, did you ever go street witnessing? I'm like, what, what's that? <laughs> he says, well, it's like when you go out in the streets and, you know, talk to people about Jesus. And I'm like, you know, I'd probably been a Christian in a couple months. I'm like, wow, that sounds really exciting. Okay. So <laughs> I grab a pile of friends and we go out on the Hill Street. That's what it was called at the time. It's now Coast Highway in Oceanside, California. And every weekend they'd release all the Marines in a sense. And it was just packed wall to wall Marines walking around. I say, let's go out to Hill Street, <laughs> you know? And they, they were, they were uh, like, uh, somebody was bringing hookers from LA and San Diego <laughs> into Oceanside on the weekends because there were so many Marines. Right. <laughs> And so we'd be wandering around just talking to people about Jesus, <laughs> you know, and, and it was to the Marines and to the hookers and, you know, and, and so what happened at that point was, you know, I, I dragged about six or seven friends that I, I worked with, that I went to church with, and, you know, out onto Hill Street, they lasted about, you know, a couple of months, maybe um, coming on and off. I think I did that for two years almost yeah almost two years at least a year and a half every single weekend like friday and saturday nights um and the payday weekends you know was like crazy it was just wall-to-wall -wall, uh marine corps until you know camp pendleton finally said sorry hill street is <laughs> off limits on the weekends um, <laughs> so yeah i for, for me, it was, how do we get the go back in the gospel, right? Right. Um, by, by, what have we created? Instead of the, the gospel, it's the stopsel. <laughs> it's, you know, we're, we're inside here, stay in your walls, you know. We're, um, yeah, so I wanted, I, I wanted to go back in. So any time I could go, and, you know, and so that's, that's where I ended up at Manti and hanging out with Mormons and hanging out with people at the Self-Realization Fellowship in Encinitas, you know, these were places I wanted to be. Um, that for me was trying to break down that, that barrier of, you know, I wouldn't have looked at it back then as a, um, a bounded set, but I was frustrated by mm -hmm. the fact that we weren't engaging a world around us. Um, let's get out of here, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I suppose I could. That could have moved toward 
you know, becoming one of those crazy street preachers that now accuse me of being a heretic. Right. Um, you know, because in a sense, they were even identifying with me back then, because, you know, I have to say, in as much as they're very fundamentalist, and oftentimes antagonistic to the world around them, at least they know there's a go in the word gospel, right? Right, right. <laughs> they're, they're at least <laughs> going outside of themselves, which a lot of the church isn't doing. So, you know, I, on one hand, both identify with them and then go, oh boy, um, that's not me. Yeah. Sorry, guys, that, that, that thing over there, no, that's not me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I don't know if it's, I sent you the questions ahead of time, but I also think it's because you and I just kind of flow together well in conversation and ministry, but let's unpack. I love what you yeah. said there at the end, right? It, it depends upon, it's not like Christians aren't going into liminal spaces. We may prefer yeah. the bounded set, but they do go into liminal spaces. However, the question is, how do we use those liminal spaces? And there right. are, I mentioned the term evangelistic raiding parties. Uh, you know, sometimes yeah, yeah, we yeah, do yeah. that. We go yeah. out into the spaces of others, like uh, Manti, which um, for those who've been keeping tabs on what the Latter-day Saints are doing, the current uh, president and prophet has, has made the decision there will be no more such pageants, which is fascinating in Mormon studies because that was yeah. an important part of what their culture was all about. But that used to be a part of what they would do. So, And there's also a, a general conference twice a year, and you'll also find uh, the so-called street preachers out there. Right. And they view what they do as a form of evangelism. To me, it's more like apologetic denunciation kind of thing. Very judgment oriented, very confrontational and in your face. And I would not consider that a good Christian way of going about drawing upon the liminal space. Your thoughts, Phil, on that? Yeah. You know, on, on one hand, I have to um, I suppose, uh, feel, feel there, feel the tension of the street preacher who's mm -hmm. wondering where is the repentance in today's gospel. You know, I, I sometimes feel that when I'm watching, uh, you know, I don't know, Christianity on TV. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just i want to go there with my signs right <laughs> repent you sinners <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I i want to speak to it and say boy is this the jesus that that we uh um should be promoting but then the same thing happens on the opposite side where they're out with their signs repent you sinners and they're speaking to the other right the person who's not a christian the the you know which it would be in uh um you know, the big O other, the person that's radically different than me. Right. Um, and somewhere there's something in between that, that looks like Jesus where we love and befriend and yet are willing to say, do you think that's the way to go? <laughs> you know? Um, as well as being open to a critique to my own religion. You know, for me, that's, that's been pretty important. It, it you know, I, I, I get, I could get a lot of trouble for this and I do get a lot of trouble for it to say that I've learned a lot from neo-pagans and I learned a lot from Mormons about, um, weaknesses of my own tribe and things that they did better. Does that mean I'm going to have a, a, a doctrinal transformation that will, you know, make me believe that uh, I'm going to have my own planet and many wives someday? No. Or that I'm going to start practicing uh, neo-pagan magic with the corresponding elements and get my smells and bells and whistles by force of will trying to change something, you know, and, and transform my concept of prayer through that. No, it doesn't mean any of those things, but there, there are fundamental issues of how people to gather together and how they treat one another that they critique about my church. And I just got to look at them and go, dang, you're right. <laughs> 
<laughs> I want to, I want, and I want to present a different kind of Christianity. So I spend a lot of time, um, you know, turning, making the apology, the new apologetics. <laughs> That's my saying, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah that's us but not my version of us <laughs> yeah so you know I, I have to admit and 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 when i do that i find that uh others do that as well you know that that's where um that's where some of the pagans go yeah you know yeah we we you know we got some messy things in our own tribe as well and <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and now an open dialogue begins to occur. Uh, you know, Mike Steigel, um, who used to be the president of the Pagan Federation, good friend of mine, I stay with him, you know, Mike, um, when I'm over there in, in the UK, I stay with him and Julie, and we've spent a lot of years talking about, yeah, we're messed up, and he'd go, yeah, we're messed up too. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's it that's such an important place to come if i can't um and i think that's part of the breaking out of the bounded set when i step out and i go yeah look at my tribe we're a mess aren't we and i and i own it then then the other can say oh yeah we see that and they start to open up and go sometimes we're a mess too well well now we have dialogue about the real things of life. And we've crossed over the place that, you know, you, you and I have talked about the, um, the usage of the word multi-faith mm -hmm. versus interfaith. Right. Right. Because sometimes interfaith is let's only talk about the good things together. Right. And multi-faith is saying, no, let's talk about the problems we all have. But if I'm going to talk about the problems, I start with me. Look at my tribe, me and my, and, and my tribe, we're a mess. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's important to keep in mind, you've touched on some of that there, that if liminality has the promise for transformation, it's not just, we're, we're so used to as Christians, we've got something valued to bring, we're going to transform the other by their rece reception of the message of the gospel, which is important. However, we're saying that through liminality, we can also be transformed if we hear from the other. Is that what you're saying? Oh, boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and I and I have to let that person know that they've had something valuable to offer me, mm -hmm. right? I I, I got to say, hey, that was amazing. I wish my tribe would learn from that, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and 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 typically, that radical, that big O other, um, whether it's neo pagans or you know, it, it could be something like goth culture or, you know, I mean, there's, there, there's all kinds of um, sometimes gypsy culture and, and, you know, and when I use the word gypsy, I need to be careful in the US, uh, the Roma don't like the term. On the other hand, uh, Billy Welch, the Shara Rom of the Appleby Horse Fair in the UK utilizes the term gypsy. And, you know, so because that's a group I know a little more about, I use it because they use it. Um, but, um, you know, they, there are Christians among them, but even their Christians are treated as the radical other by the society around them because they're nomadic people. Um, and that's not understood in what, by the, what has been called the settled bias of, you know, our, our culture that understands things in terms of ownership and having, you know, a landed home. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, yeah, those boundaries are, <laughs> right. Are, are killing us. Yeah. And I think again, it's where that whole monsters thing can get in the way. Um, mm. uh, because we perceive yeah. some groups as so monstrous, maybe even the embodiment yeah. of spiritual yeah, yeah, evil yeah. that we can't learn anything from them. Um, you know, and there are certain, especially for evangelicals, there are certain religious groups that are boogeymen for us that are, that are, you know, we're fearful in general, but there are some groups that really push our buttons. And uh, one of those are our Satanists. And uh, I, I can say in all honesty that I have learned some important lessons from looking at the Satanic temple. 
Um, as much yeah. as they are very good at pushing Christian buttons, they're yeah. also very good at challenging Christian privilege in the public square, not right, only right. through legal action, but through the kind of performance display that they do, which is kind of right. interesting. And so on the one hand, I'm not saying that I want to become a member of the Satanic Temple, but on the other hand, I can say that I, I think some of what they're doing has value and we as Christians can learn from it yeah, if yeah. we have bring the right mindset to it. And I think being right. in that liminal space with them help, can be transformative in a positive way. Yeah, yeah. And you're, you're, you're talking specifically about the Satanic Temple that was in Salem? It's in Salem, yes. Yeah, 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 which is a, a fairly new group. And so they're, they're an interesting, um, I suppose, analogy to the um you know to to the person who would be missional and stand in a space between the church and the the big o other because when they came into salem and it's still very much the case today when they came into salem um the witches and neo-pagans were like wow get these people out of here and there they were going, that's not us. <laughs> right, right. They, they don't represent us. And in a very real way, they don't. There's, right. um, you know, Satanism and neo-paganism uh, don't have a common thread, really, um, uh, for, for, for their beginning points. And if anything, Satanism is a kickback against Christianity you know, an inversion of it as opposed to, you know, something other based out of uh, uh, ancient paganism. Um, so, um, but, but yeah, I watched that. The Christians didn't like them. The witches didn't like them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so they had, they had a rather difficult time making any friends in Salem. And it, it really hasn't changed significantly uh, at this point in time, but you can find them out on the streets with the table you know, in October when all the crowds are coming um, <laughs> to, to, to talk to people about the right. satanic temple and uh, yeah, their yeah, view. I, it's complex dynamics. I mean, I recently had a conversation with, uh, before we recorded the podcast with a, a witch friend of mine and she was describing, you know, she appreciates the work that I've done with, with that group, but she said, you know, there was a tension there with the pagan community and I get it. I understand you're trying to establish your own identity Right. And dispel stereotypes, and then somebody comes in that just uh, problematizes all of that and creates more problems. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, so. yeah. And and when anthropologists are identifying them within the, a neo pagan kind of a construct, right? Then for the witch, they're the equivalent of our Westboro Baptist Church or something like that, right? Right. Or, or maybe our Jim Jones. That's kind of how they look at it. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Oh, that's Christian. That that's pagan. It's kind of like we go. <laughs> people say that's Christian. That's right. <laughs> we go. Wait. 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 <laughs> yeah. So. For folks who want to pursue more, Joseph Laycock's got a great book. Speak Speak of the Devil. I think if I remember correctly, hmm. uh, is a great little uh, book that that I would encourage. In fact, uh, I had an interview with Joe where we covered a whole range of the interesting topics that he covers. But that's yeah. that's another podcast. But let's try and make some application here for listeners and viewers. We've got an American church that is struggling with its credibility and its identity, even though many times it doesn't recognize it yet. Um, I just wonder what it's going to take yeah, yeah, for yeah. pastors and denominations to realize that it's not just we're being picked on, that we've got some serious problems. What kinds of things would you like to see the American church do with liminality? Mm. Uh, the church itself... Um, maybe mission organizations, uh, what kinds of remedy and positive aspects can appropriate uses of, of liminality provide for the church? Tough one. That's, that, that, that that, that's huge. One. Just a few thoughts. Yeah. Well, so in some sense, um, there's, there's a number of us who've been coming to Salem, you know, have been coming to Salem for now it's 20 something years um engaging on the streets during halloween the numbers were very small in the beginning and toward the end of my time living there because I, I you know i've been nomadic for about four or five years now um and toward the time of uh living there and having a spot where we could do outreach and 
you know, we were running a live stave, stage, a stage with, with live music every weekend, sometimes giving away hot cocoa. One year it was like 10,000 cups of it over the course of the month. And it was, it was our invitation for people to hang out at this party. Then we'd have these spiritual encounters that were based out of a, a, a missional construction. You know, it was basically saying, uh, come meet us and let's talk about spirituality. Um, we had somewhere around 250 people coming through the month doing that that went on for years so there literally were thousands who learned to engage that space and then there were groups that started doing some of these groups began doing other festivals and started going to those places to engage um, similar things um the church needs those uh, you know churches when i say the church evangelicalism needs to get a little, you know, get, get a little um, bolder and allow the people who think like that. And are, there's some people that are comfortable in those spaces. Let them go be comfortable in those spaces and um, engage festivals and um, people from other religions. Um, and, and the church, you know, then if, if you allow them to do it, you can then highlight it and say, here's what's going on, some interesting stuff, uh, where we're, we're thinking of our evangelism in a different context. Um, and, and I do think also there's, there needs to be a, maybe a, uh, a theological reframing of our word evangelism. Um, I personally don't think that I can convert anybody. You know, a, a true conversion is an interaction between the individual and God. And I can talk about my religion in my life and hear about their religion in their life. And we can, you know, uh, uh, identify similarities and contrasts and you know, and make friends with one another and hang out. But if there's any, any going to be any real transformation, I'm just not your let's have an altar call kind of guy, because in this altar call, you're going to say, yes, I need Jesus. And that's going to be the moment you're transformed. I, I can't guarantee by that outward action that anything is going to happen. And, and the altar call is, you know, really a brand new thing in culture. It's maybe a hundred years old. Um, in the way that we understand it, the altar call is uh, Finney didn't really do it. You know, we, we give him uh, some, uh, we give him credit for having started it. Um, anything that looked like it probably started it before with, you know, Francis Asbury and the Methodist circuit writers, but it didn't look like that. And a person was asked to kind of work out their salvation with fear and trembling get on your knees and have it out with god right um as opposed to say this formulaic prayer and now you're going to be a christian so i i don't look at myself as providing that kind of thing instead i'm just we're talking about life and and if we can reformulate our view of evangelism as something that's not okay you know, I'm going to grab you out of the fires of hell and drag you over to my side right now. Um, but rather, we're just going to talk about life and you and I are going to walk together through it um, to discover truth and, and, and be open along the way to recognize my own blind spots that they might be able to point out. I, you know, I think if we can reformulate that, then there's a hope that more Christians can learn how to you know, walk in this liminal space. Um, and, and some of that then means, uh, you know, for me, um, it's, I'm going to go there, come with me, you know, so I, I, I did have just have some discussions with the, um, with, with some people in the UK about this very thing. And they were asking, boy, would you be willing to train our people to go to these places you go? to the festivals and the festivals include things like the fairy festival, which is a primarily um, the pagan event, um, uh, you know, philosophy festival that is, is, you know, 
uh, another other mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that includes a lot of atheists and right. scientists um, and uh, you know Czech anarchists and I mean there's there's these different other groups the UK gypsies uh, you know I want to say come with me and learn with me and in a sense be afraid along the way <laughs> I we had to go through that right right oh yeah yeah, I mean, weren't there times you're going, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I resonate with all those sentiments. I, I think if I were to add to it, I would just hope that the church, church can learn to be more comfortable with the liminal space as an important part of its central DNA and not just, you know, we're, all, we're about to worship, yeah. we come here and oh yeah, we also have uh, a missions department we support that we support good works right. in the community we have a food pantry great stuff i'm not minimizing that but it's almost like it's an addendum it's an add-on it's not a central part of what defines the church and i think the church yeah. needs to be out there constantly doing the things being christ to the world and not just and i think those things themselves are an act of worship it's not just corp corporate worship with sermons yeah. and hymns and you, you know what i'm saying yeah. so it's an expanded yeah. concept of worship through like liminality that. through service humility am, am i nuts here <laughs> oh i love that i absolutely love that and and you know for me it's almost um unfathomable to think that we don't understand that because um early on in the development of evangelicalism we were the monstrosized other right um, our, our, our own people, the church, as we're saying, hey, we're not sure that we've got it right. And so we want to do it in a new way. We were monstrosized by the other. And then when Pentecostalism came along, you know, 1901, Agnes Osmond speaking in tongues and the breakout of the Azusa Street revival with, you know, the one eyed black preacher from LA who created this, but didn't create it, it just kind of happened. He was like, what is going on? And and people of all races and um, societal uh, subgroups were coming into this crazy thing that was happening. And it was monstrosized both by the press and by um, other Christians. Um, G. Campbell Morgan made a statement about the Pentecostal movement. He called it the last vomit of Satan <laughs> on the earth, you know, during the end times. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so. So we have been there as that, which to me would say, why don't we, if we could remember that in our own history, we would probably identify with the outsider and be able to hang out with them in, you know, in, in, in peaceful and I, in an identifying way, you know, rather than an oppositional identificational um, uh, engagement with the person who's, you know, not a Christian. Right. Well, let me uh, get your reaction to one last thing on liminality. And before we talk about uh, close with uh, you telling folks about what you got coming up, I found this book for those of you who are watching the, the, mm. uh, the YouTube uh, channel here came up this year. It's titled uh, crossing thresholds, a practical theology of liminality. And it's right. got multiple contributors. Uh, most of them are from the UK. And I think these are folks we're going to have to try and connect with. But there's uh, one point in the book where they quote Timothy Carson when he says this liminal reality can offer people of faith and especially those in leadership positions, a hermeneutical key and a pastoral method. Your reaction? Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I wrote Burning Religion, um, and that came out 2015. I, you know, I'd been I'd been working a number of years on on that terminology that I use, wild theology. And <clears throat> I suppose I <clears throat> I I really was talking about to a great degree liminality, um, although not utilizing that terminology, um, because. As, as I'm developing this wild theology, and you know, that was the first of kind of a trilogy of um, books I want to put out on the subject, I was looking at developing my theology as, um, I suppose I would look at it in, in this way, a good way to describe it is, um, 
Calvinism tends to view the development of theology from a construction of who is God, and in that uh, dynamically radical otherness of God, we've created, you know, our five points of Calvinism, <laughs> you know, humanity in contrast is in total depravity and is totally other than God and cannot relate in any way whatsoever. And then you've got your unconditional election. He just decides who and, and chooses. And then the uh, limited atonement, Christ only died for a certain number of people. And those are the ones who will be saved. And um, the uh, irresistible grace, can't resist his grace. You're going to be saved if he's chosen you and the perseverers and saints. You'll run along with it. And then your your five points of, uh, you know, what were later attributed to Arminius, though he didn't, kind of like Calvin, he didn't lay out any five points, but then the construct was different. You had free will and, um, you know, er everything was in direct opposition to it. One was built from the construct of we're going to look at the radical holy otherness of God, and one was built from looking at humanity and oh this is how we think god deals with man so you know it was it's kind of like looking at, at at theology from both sides and and so my wild theology was really is really built out of i suppose a bit like uh the orthodox church the space in between you know this this space of unknown the liminal space is where the wildness comes from. And in a sense, I kind of look at my theology as developing out of there. It's in my experience of the middle. Um, you know, so, so, so that, that very thing, when he's saying in the liminal space, we'll, we'll find um, things that will help the church. Um, boy, I really identify with that. I, you know, I'm, I'm developing my own thought theology out of liminal spaces, out of that impossible place. And in a sense, out of the mysteries, um, both of God and of the other person, right? Um, so that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hope, yes. Well, and, and for my part, that, that idea about being a hermeneutical key um, I haven't read the book cover to cover, but I have thumbed through good portions of it. They, they primarily are looking at how we can approach scripture, which is a natural place for hermeneutics. However, right. I think it's a hermeneutical key, not only for how we uh, interpret scripture, how we interpret the other, how we yeah. interpret church, ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it can have a lot of possibilities. So uh, I, I don't think you and I can say enough about the importance of uh of this idea of the practical, yeah, I always yeah, found yeah. it interesting that there was a sub-discipline called practical theology, <laughs> uh, right? If it's not practical, it doesn't seem to be real valuable, but. Uh, <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> that's right, that's right. We've got yeah. this, we've got this good the other theology over here, and then we got the practical stuff we'll do on the side. But, right, right, yeah, it, to me, it's also kind of like, and anthropological missiology is <laughs> what it's not what, yeah, yeah. It, it's not naturally a part of missiology <laughs> excuse me that's right well i will yeah. include a, a link to the, the this book here crossing thresholds for folks who want to pursue yeah, it yeah 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 uh, i think i'm going to reach out to the contributors just to let them know oh what, yeah, yeah yeah see what yeah, I, was, I was looking at names and thinking i need to reach out to them as well yeah so uh yeah. you and i great conversation on liminality. I want folks to hopefully connect the dots and think about it, whatever ministry context they're in. But I want to yeah. use the last few moments of our conversation. Tell folks about what you're doing with your trip to Wales and uh, how they can get involved in it. Okay. Yeah. So I, I've, I've got a couple things going on right now. Um, I remember sending, sending you um, about two years ago, Hey, I'm writing this book, love bigger, go home, which is, you know, kind of based on how do we how do we traverse um, interaction with subcultures? And particularly this was dealing with nomadic subculture and saying that the gospel itself is nomadic, so we ought to understand it. Um, and then COVID came and it's like, okay, nobody's gonna be traveling. I don't think they'll publish this book. <laughs> so, so I've gone back to it now and I, I'm uh, you know, re-looking at it with some, some new academic stuff that's come out as well as, um, Add, 
creating a chronological story of my travels and you know Priscilla the motorhome um, <laughs> um, through the chapters. So uh, uh, that's um, that's that was complete two years ago. Now in a sense is being recompleted with uh, a little bit of stuff that's happened since then. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I'm on the cusp right here of moving to Wales. Um, I, uh, I'm here in California, in, in a sense, to say goodbye to family. Hey, I'm leaving you, <laughs> leaving the country. I know I went 3,000 miles 20 years ago. I'm going another 3,000 miles. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's really, um, it's another cultural jump because I'm moving to, the plan is to move to Carnarvon, North Wales, um, where 90 plus percentage of the population speaks Welsh and Manun um, And so uh, in moving there, I have to move from being um, a proficient learner of Welsh to somehow getting to uh, the kind of fluency that is comfortable uh, with the person who's a native born Welsh speaker and maybe didn't speak English until they were mm -hmm. seven, nine years old. Um, and, and that area of North Wales has a lot of that. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm talking with the uh, Baptist Union of Wales and they have predominant, this particular group, I'm, you know, I'm dealing with uh, Welsh language churches across Wales. Um, in the second year that I'm there, I'm hoping to do something similar to my nomadic travels with Priscilla the motorhome across the United States. Um, I'm planning on taking a year. Actually, I want to I want to do a year in a day. <laughs> <laughs> so I start on the same day and end on the same day, right? Um, and begin a walk across Wales from village to village, staying with the people, um, walking with groups every day, doing historical things, having debates and you know discussions about things along the way. Uh, I'll have my guitar over my back and you know do some pub gigs and things like that. But I'll spend the entire year walking around Wales and not speaking anything but Welsh hmm. um, for that year, you know, kind of, kind of make my, my, my promise. And, and this is based out of the whole, the, the title, the Prince of Wales. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of people won't, uh, don't actually realize that the title Prince of Wales really these days doesn't have any connection to Wales. It's, you know, somebody who's in line for the crown right now, Charles, um, has the title Prince of Wales, which, you know, he was inducted as the Prince of Wales at Carnarvon Castle, where I'm moving in 1968, I believe it was, and it was met with some protests. Um, in fact, the government was a, kind of afraid that um, to do it there initially, because their, the protests were enough, they thought there might be violence. Um, uh, for the, you know, the, the people who would like to see an independent Wales, which today it's a growing number of people, but um, that, that title Prince of Wales belongs to the crown and the person is not Welsh at all. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at moving into that culture that is an other group of people by the British, um, the government, um, by Westminster. So, uh, yeah, I'll be I'll be uh, learning to work in Welsh and uh, speak in Welsh and uh, sing in Welsh and <laughs> all of that stuff. And I've been spent I've been I've been taking uh, the last probably about fifteen years spending a lot of time there. I, you know, I'm not stepping into place I'm unfamiliar. They know me. I know them. We've got good relationships, and I'm 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 so excited about it right now. Um, so. Yeah, I do have um, a Patreon page, um, you know, Patreon and Phil Wyman. Um, Shoot me a Patreon. link afterwards and I'll include it in the program notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then um, for my book, Burning Religion, I have a uh, burningreligion.com uh, <clears throat> website where I also 
because this is you know going to be an ongoing uh, dialogue of kind of crossing boundaries like burning religion the book was about um i i blog there about some of these things as well so awesome well again we'll include links to that in the uh, program notes as we set this up this great conversation here that you'll find at both multi-faith matters and the wild theology podcast it's been great man it's always fun to have a conversation with you oh man i sure enjoy it yeah <laughs> yeah you know um uh we need to be closer than we are it's a good thing we have zoom <laughs> that's that's true yeah especially when you start that that year-long tour you know to keep a computer on your back along with your uh, guitar it, yeah and and a and a drone <laughs> yeah there you um, go that'd be that, awesome that, yeah i mean there's some plans for that kind of thing and i've got a i actually have a few friends who are filmmakers who have been talking to me about okay we want to follow you on some of this journey and you know and that that's kind of like an area of p potential prayer if somebody wants to pray for this that you know right resources would be reached so um it would be something people in wales could follow around too whether you know it, uh, on some kind of media so yeah nice. well let me wrap up this recording man and you and i have a few parting words again my guest phil wyman of wild theology and so many other things look in the program notes Click on it to find out what he's doing. Lend your support as he prepares for this transition. And my thanks to everybody who's listening and watching on whatever venue you happen to be. I'm John Moorhead again with the Wild, or not with the Wild Theology. That's Phil Wyman. This is Multi-Faith Matters. Thanks for watching and listening.